In order to better understand the Earth we live on, geologists and other scientists study the Earth's surface and how it changes. Geologic phenomena such as earthquakes create a hazard for people and infrastructure. It is important for scientists to understand how faults work so that we can be prepared for such hazards. They do so by studying the effects of earthquakes on the Earth's surface. You know, look at many of the recent earthquakes that have uh, caused great destruction. The Izmit uh, earthquake in Turkey killed 17,000 people, and they had modern construction. So I think the main concern uh, is uh, loss of life and then loss of property. During large earthquakes, the Earth's surface is often displaced along a fault. Measuring this offset along the fault is important for understanding fault behavior. To better understand geologic processes such as plate tectonics and earthquakes, scientists are striving to use new technology, such as light detection and ranging, or LIDAR, to create accurate models of Earth's surface. Being able to depict features on Earth's surface smaller than a meter is critical for the study of faulting and earthquakes. Unlike other technologies, LIDAR is capable of producing such finely detailed or high-resolution models of the Earth's surface. These data help scientists to map the locations of active faults, reconstruct fault offsets from past earthquakes, and study landscape evolution by understanding the interaction between faulting and surface processes. The goal is to be better prepared for future earthquakes by understanding the behavior of past earthquakes and how faults work. LIDAR is a remote sensing technology that produces very detailed topographic maps. Collecting airborne LIDAR is both expensive, costing several hundred dollars per square kilometer, and logistically involved. Scientists work with organizations such as the National Center for Airborne Laser Mapping to gather data along active faults. For the study of earthquake activity, the LIDAR scanner is typically mounted on an airplane and is used to measure the Earth's surface by combining the scanning pulse laser with corrections for changing aircraft orientation and GPS aircraft positions. A low-flying aircraft scans a laser at pulse rates of tens to hundreds of pulses per second. Laser returns are collected by the instrument, which catalogs the timing of return, the scanner orientation, and aircraft position using GPS. The raw data collected by the LiDAR scanner is typically referred to as a point cloud. A point cloud is the collection of individual bounces of the laser from the as the plane flies over. And so for each point in this cloud, the point has a, has a its position in space, so it's x, y, z coordinates, and latitude, longitude, and elevation, plus some number of attributes associated with that point. So it would be information like whether it's vegetation or ground, the exact time when it was collected, and all this other information. From the three-dimensional point clouds, surfaces, or digital elevation models, or DEMs, with one elevation per pixel, can be computed. These standard products are then used to visualize and measure features of the ground. They can also be used to reconstruct fault offsets, simulate water runoff, and analyze the landscape response to faulting and erosion. One of the reasons that LiDAR is very valuable is the fact that it, it provides a representation of the landscape and the topography at resolutions that were not previously possible with other topography data. There have been these digital elevation models created, but they're typically at much lower resolution. So the U.S. Geological Survey has national coverage in digital elevation models, but they're at 30 meter resolution or 10 meters resolution, as opposed to LiDAR, which tends to be between you know, half a meter and two meter resolution. And so the kinds of things you can see in the, in the data, because the the resolution is so much higher, is significant and has a great utility for all kinds of various for science types of applications. So one of the exciting things for a geologist is that for all about LIDAR is that you can use it to remove vegetation and this allows you to see the features that are underneath the trees, things like fault scarps or landslides or other hazards. Because of the power of LIDAR data and the cost of data collection, it is important that the data be made widely available. One example of a source of LiDAR data for the research community and the general public is the Open Topography Facility hosted by the San Diego Supercomputer Center at University of California, San Diego. So one of the challenges with high-resolution topography for LiDAR data is just the sheer amount of data that technology can produce. So for any given data set, you may have many billions of individual LiDAR points, and those points occupy some number of terabytes of disk space. 
And so it made sense that a place like the San Diego Supercomputer Center would be a good resource for hosting those data sets and providing access through a web portal for the community. Open Topography provides access to point cloud data, DEMs, hillshades, and even Google Earth compatible files to allow scientists access to relevant data products for their research. LiDAR data along active faults provides an important perspective for studying earthquakes. Most major faults in Southern California have been scanned and earth scientists are enthusiastically using the data. One of the ways that the LiDAR is used is imagine if this is the San Andreas Fault and this is a channel coming across it like so and it's been offset through time so with each earthquake it's offset a little more and so what Olaf Zielka has shown is that in the 1857 earthquake it probably only moved by about five meters and then adding the previous earthquake to that it's about a nine meter offset so in C's 1978 paper he noticed these consistently nine-ish meter offsets presumed that that was slipped from 1857 but the LIDAR allowed Olaf to extract more detail and show that there was a systematic uh, pattern there and that there was a set of these smaller offsets that were about half of the nine meters. Of, of all the really interesting features along the San Andreas Fault, Wallace Creek really stands out as the exemplary place to really understand how the San Andreas Fault works. Just by seeing that site, you can just understand how the fault moves. You can see that earthquake after earthquake, that channel's been offset and then you can see that it re-incised and was offset some more. You might think that with all the wonderful aerial photographs that have been taken and all the detailed topographic maps that have been made, that that's it, we've learned what we can. But when we have LiDAR data, even for a well-known area, it sometimes reveals things that we didn't quite appreciate before. At Mystic Lake near San Bernardino, California, Paleoseismologists are studying the San Jacinto Fault by digging trenches to look at subsurface structure. We've dug this trench across the San Jacinto Fault uh, on the dry lake bed of Mystic Lake, and this is within a uh, step over within the fault. We've got the Casaloma Fault Strand on the west side of the valley coming in from the south, and then the uh, Claremont Fault on the east side of the valley. And so within this fault step over, there's this uh, zag pond that has formed called Mystic Lake, and it has nice fine-grained sediments, so we're uh, digging the trench here to look for good stratigraphy that crosses the fault so we can see where it's offset and document the, the prehistoric earthquakes. Well, I've used LiDAR throughout the whole study that we've been doing the last four years now along this stretch of the San Jacinto Fault. And in general, I've been using it to, to help identify potential sites, both paleoseismic sites and slip rate sites. LIDAR has allowed us to quantify displacement in the past several earthquakes along the San Jacinto and the San Andreas Faults. We're expanding that out now to the Elsinore and other major faults in Southern California and some in the Eastern California Shear Zone. But it's incredibly increased our knowledge of how large uh, these, these earthquakes are by looking at how much displacement past earthquakes have produced. So, um, I guess the big advantage of the airborne LiDAR is that the scale is just about right for the problems that we're interested in right now. And as the LiDAR gets better and better, we're going to constantly be pushing to um, get even higher resolution. And who, who knows what we might learn from that.